excited to be doing this panel with Sarah Harden, who is the CEO of Hello Sunshine, and Christy Hauberger from CAA. So there is this collective movement called Time's Up, and you guys are part of the force behind this movement. Demystify it for this group. What is Time's Up all about? So back in October, you know, when we, um, all of the, the, a lot of women I work with and women in our industry were just horrified by what was being revealed about things that had happened with our industry. And I don't want to give, the, you know, this person any credit for it, but catalyzed a lot of, a lot of uh, interest on our part in trying to see what we could do to sort of change this. So if you really need something done, ask a really busy woman. <laughs> <laughs> and so we took a bunch of really busy women and 20 women from across our industry, including our competitors, including our buyers, including our clients, and we decided to get in a room and say, all right, what are we going to do about this? How do we keep this from happening? And uh, one of the actresses who was in the room, who had come very on sort of short notice, brought her baby girl. And... You know, little Amalia is like nine or ten months old at the time. And there was a great moment where you look at this kid and you're like, what world do we want her to walk into, right? And how long do we have to fix it? And, you know, when you start breaking down the issues around sexual harassment and the issues around um, the, the inequities in our workplaces, the thing you realize really is it's actually not about sex, as you know, it's about power. And so we decided we're going to redistribute power and equity in our business. And we're going to do so by a number of strategies, but we're going to do so because the scrutiny in our industry, or the scrutiny of our, and the visibility of our industry is so high that if we could do it, perhaps other industries could do, to, do it also. And we were fortunate to receive a letter um, from Monica Ramirez, who runs the Alianza Campesina, the Farm Workers Association, in November to say, we're with you, we stand with you. And it helped us really broaden the focus about how do we think about not only our industry, but the, the world as a whole. So, uh, you know, we're going we're gonna to change it all. <laughs> so, Sarah, why now? I mean, the stories that have come out about the entertainment industry, I, I started out as an entertainment lawyer, mm -hmm. and I have stories. Right. <laughs> right? None of this is a surprise. Right. Um, why now? Why is it that the sentiment has changed? What's different today that makes all of this possible? Well, I, look, I think it's a couple of things. I, I think uh, things persist when there are no consequences. And I, I think we lived in a world where there were no consequences. And I think what also happened, you know, I was, re I was reading this interesting NPR article a few weeks ago, and it talked about this concept of horizontal violence, where people yeah. turn on each other when uh, they don't have the power to affect systems that are affecting, affecting them. And I think what you saw in the election of Trump was um, this impatience and anger over the fact that what you saw was ultimately the country saying, it's okay for a predator to be elected president. And I think that laid the groundwork for the Harvey things where it became enough is enough. And I think what it's galvanized, I think it's flipped that concept on its head. Mm -hmm. And that's what Time's Up's really been about from into horizontal action, where you've got a set of those conditions that women have come out and said, oh, hang on, there is this bizarre world out here now where um, my experiences do matter. And these brave women who came forward with a voice to say, oh, all of a sudden there are some consequences. And I think what's really interesting is what you've seen. And I think the farm workers union letter was like, yeah. incredibly moving, yeah. which was this, this is not about Hollywood, it's not about, um, I think there's a mouthpiece that the entertainment industry has, but this horizontal action movement is about women locking arms across industries to say, indeed, enough is enough, time is up. And I think that is really those set of conditions that came forward um, that have given rise to what I think now is a real movement that is having effects and where I think women feel hopeful for change. Yeah, I want to say two things. So one of the first things we did, you all may have heard about or hopefully contributed to, and by the way, you can still contribute, which is the Time's Up Legal Defense Fund. Because one of the things that we found is that you can talk about how inadequate or insufficient our current laws are, but even access to justice, being able to get a lawyer and to get help 
was one of the biggest barriers from people even pursuing these things. And so we raised $20 million, $21 million in the last, you know, since January 1st, right? And, um, and I, and I, I want to say, you know, that is being administered by the National Women's Law Center, who has been providing this kind of work and these kinds of services for a very long time. And so we really wanted to not reinvent the wheel. Yeah. You know, we didn't discover feminism or equality, obviously. We are, we are just hopefully, you know, putting some, some additional rocket fuel behind it so that we sort of get to this escape velocity that will allow us to transcend where we've been. But the other thing I wanted to say that I really have enjoyed is, you know, I've been friends with Sarah and I've known Sarah for a while and worked with Sarah, but the opportunity we have in this moment to be, you know, what we describe as the joyful warrior, right? And, and it's hard because this stuff, and I think, you know, um, has everyone in this room been, been touched or spoken to inappropriately among the women particularly? <laughs> okay. oh, by women? Yeah. By women. Oh, no, yeah. No, yeah. no oh, by sorry, the way, no. Sec no. totally Wait, separate topic. No, I said, has everyone been touched or spoken to inappropriately at work? Yes, right? Yes. Um, so one of the things, at, at some point, I really want to talk about how we get to lessen our insurance premiums when women are in charge because we don't touch anybody, but that's a whole separate thing. But in the meanwhile, one of the things that's really hard about this is that it comes from a place of pain. It come, we've all been, by the way, men and women have not only been, you know, have, have become survivors of, of abusive situations, but we've all been hurt by an unjust system that doesn't allow us to unlock the potential of every worker and every bit of innovation. And when only one kind of person gets to do that job, we're not seeing the full potential. And even just the lost economic capacity of the people who've been held back is really unfortunate. But the truth is we can't let that anger be, it can be your motivation, it cannot be your message. And so we really, really want to be joyful warriors in this moment. And part of the joy for me is working with women like Sarah and having this opportunity to lock arms with women who are, you know, women organizing janitors and women working in restaurants and women doing farm work so that we can sort of see those great, incredible places of intersection and shared journey, but also find the joy in the relationships that we create and have found. So every entrepreneur in this room has has had naysayers, right? Has had people say, that's a terrible idea, don't do it. And you almost know you're doing something right when you have enough naysayers who are paying attention to you. Speaking of the Legal Defense Fund, one of the conversations that's happening is a question of whether there's going to be a backlash. So let's turn into that. What do you say when this question of a backlash comes up? Can I, I think um, this is a front-footed movement and I think you know, this is not women asking for permission. This is women with agency and action and individuals. And I think what's really different about this movement too, which is like, um, you know, as a white straight woman, this is an intersectional movement because we talk about the inequalities of women. I tell you, if you're a woman of colour, if you, the, it's shameful, even the stats around venture capital, all of them, board representation, CEOs and everything else. So I say this is a, this is an intersectional movement as well. And, um, you know, what I would say about that front-footed movement is I think we have to not feed the narrative that talks about the edge cases, that worries more about overreach at the expense of talking about the real harm that has mm. been done to women. Yeah. I think the other thing that, you know, while this is a movement, we can't forget that if you're talking about issues of sexual harassment, they're, act, they're the result of individuals making decisions. So when you get the... I mean, literally, he's my dentist. is like, well, what do you say about the networking and should I network with women? And I'm like, because I'm worried about something. I'm like, you know what? In that situation, you are in control of your individual actions. Like, don't be a douchebag. <laughs> don't be a douchebag. Rule and of if, thumb. You have to th if you have Good to think twice thumb. about, you know, an edge case, if you have to think twice about whether you should ask a 21-year-old coworker to sleep with you and you're worried, is that like consent or is it not? Like, maybe in this moment, think twice. And I... I <laughs> So I, I'm frustrated with the, and, and, and it's not to say there aren't instances of injustices, but we cannot feed that narrative right now. The bigger narrative is more important, which is the systemic inequality, pay equity, and not having equitable and safe workplaces. And so I just say front foot it um, and keep focusing on that because we have so much work to do. I am, um, so I, I agree 100% with what Sarah has said, and I think 
One of the interesting things that I get a lot in the sort of backlash conversation that I love to say to men is because the truth is most men don't do these things, right? Most men and most people don't behave this way. And so I think there are two things that I say, I understand you want to help. Let me give you a couple of things to do. Because usually it's somebody yearning for some acknowledgement of, I'm a good person, I didn't do these things, I want some acknowledgement of that, and I'm, you know, that's what I, I'm, let me just, let me assume that, okay. Yeah. So, <laughs> I think there are two really interesting things, or a couple of things that all of us can do. One is, operate from where you are. What are the things that you control? If, do you control the hiring of vendors, of your law firm, of your, uh, of your agency, of what, what do you control, right? And, and if you begin to scrutinize, what are the decisions they make? How many women partners are there? How many people of color? You as a customer can ask those questions. You as someone who's hiring can make some deliberate positive movement on these things. And so I think that's one thing. So to start from where you are and what you can do and what you can control. And then the, the second thing, that I always advise men to do is if you really want to help, find a woman who does exactly what you do, ideally at the same firm, and tell her what you make. Let's just start with transparency. And I just, I think there, and then, well, the last thing I would say is go from being a bystander being an upstander, right? So that you're putting the world on notice that not on your watch, not, our, not on your watch is it going to be, is, is locker room talk going to be, be, be tolerated? Not on your watch are you going to pay a certain group of people less than another group of people? Because that's actually who you are and the kind of leader you are. And I think, you know, starting by even those small things in the spheres that we control. Uh, recently we had a client who was deciding whether or not to put a really big television show on one network versus the other. And so she decided to pose the question, how many direct reports to the CEO are women and people of color? Oh, one. Okay. Now, it, I'm not saying it's going to be the deciding factor, but just by even asking the question, a conversation gets had, a different conversation gets had, and that's something we can all do. Yeah, Mark Benioff uh, recently in an interview said every CEO can pick one thing. Just pick, start with one thing you, you want to do differently to drive a culture of diversity and inclusion. And it all started with a meeting he had where he looked around and said, where are the women? Why aren't there more women? So, Sarah, call to action for this group of women here. You know, I think they're all really good things. And I think there is this notion of, um, this gets to this notion of we all have agency in this movement. And, um, you know, I think it came out of our New York Times Up group, this notion of just plus one. I, and you can yeah. adapt that however you like. If you're in a company with female consumers and you're designing a product and there isn't a woman in the room, ask why not? Um, if you are going into a meeting and you've got a junior colleague and you're trying to decide, oh, sure, bring them. Plus one, everything. If you get asked to a conference and to speak, see if you can sneak in your assistant. Um, I think this, this, I, this powerful sort of daily thing of plus one, I think it changes culture. And you, if you change the narrative and the story for one woman, you are changing the narrative for all women over time. And, and I think that is part of this. There is a lot you can do as an individual. I think second to that, I think finding new questions really important. The structural issues we have are about power and are about economic power. And so it includes pay equity is absolutely front and center. Anything you can do. So questions, you're being hired. You're being asked about salary. Am I being paid as the same as other men in the role? Um, there are, there are a lot of questions that, that even bring those issues to the fore. And um, I think the last thing, if you are founders or other things, just to this issue of economic equality, cap tables, cap tables, cap tables. You've got to get women on your cap tables. And not cap tables of, of you know, the, the companies that no one wants to fund. Let's see if a woman will fund it. Like the hot companies that people are calling around and they've got $2 million that's unallocated. If you've got the power to call a woman who's got money and get her on your cap table because there's a huge distribution of wealth that has happened in Silicon Valley and other places because of men getting special access to cap tables. And so that's mm. another one. If you have any control over access yeah. to cap tables. And what about advice to, there's uh, a lot of younger women in the room who want to be entrepreneurs, but today maybe they're not, maybe they're working in a company, they're not leaders yet, they don't have the power yet. 
what's the uplifting message, the advice that you would give to them as they encounter obstacles, as, as everyone does one way or another on their journey? So I was an entrepreneur long ago in my career, 20 years ago, and I founded a magazine called Latina. I'm not advising anyone to go in the magazine business, <laughs> but I do, I do hope you take this journey. And let me just tell you, there has never been a better time to be who you are than right now. You know, our grandmothers could not have pictured this room. I mean, just think about it. Yeah. And I think the, 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 the previous speaker who spoke about the networking being the job, that the networking, like it is a legitimate function and it's a legitimate task that you need to pursue. And I find that, that as women, we're, you know, even just as we speak about this, we make these self-deprecating comments or we're, I'm crushing it. You know, we don't do that, but we need to take a bit of a page from that and, and market yourself and, and be, I, I, I kind of, the word I want to say is a little bit shameless about it because it's going to take more than shameless. you think. <laughs> yeah, it is going to take, it's just going to take more than you think. And the thing about, uh, about it is, like I said, there are people who want to be enrolled and engaged and invested in your business. They just haven't met you yet. And so I'm, I'm excited for all of you who are going to be founders and CEOs and executives because I'm excited to have a front row seat to see what you all do. I would say, I mean, I am an entrepreneur now by the definition of a venture-backed company, but I worked, in, I worked in corporate America for 10, 15 years, and I always saw myself as an entrepreneur. The qualities of an entrepreneur of agency mm -hmm. and authority and get shit done. And I would say my advice to you is be someone who gets shit done. I mean, I... Mm -hmm. I I the see world is divided it, into it, people who get shit done and people who don't get shit done. There is. It really is. Yeah. Like, yeah. And, and I tell you, a lot of times, and I do see this with, um, there is a rush sometimes to get to places. And like, oh, and it's all very, you know what? You've got, uh, there's no shortcuts to laying a career down brick by brick. Those bricks are authentic relationships, male allies and mentors. I will tell you, um, you know, the powers, of, the structure of powers is still by men. I would not be here today without like six or seven amazing men who advocated for me, who got me in rooms. I mean, and, and I tell their stories now really, really vocally because that's, they're, they're part of why I'm here. But brick by brick by brick, and I hear a lot of impatience to get to places in the next level. There are no shortcuts to being good by just showing up in stuff you love, laying the foundation and taking a 20 to 30 year view about your career. We have to widen the aperture of what success means. And you know, I, I feel like I'm going to, I feel like I'm a great CEO in my forties. I wanted to be a CEO in my twenties. And for me, I wasn't there. And so, you know, I think widen your aperture is my big message around everything about success and what it means. And you can only do that by like laying it down brick by brick. So widen your aperture. Be good at what you do. Network. Get shit done. <laughs> and don't touch awesome. anyone. And don't, don't touch, touch anyone. anyone. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much.